Welcome tribe members and extended tribe to another episode of Conscious Leaders. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Jenny Emery. Jenny is a senior people leader. She's author of Leading for Organizational Change, which is all about building purpose, motivation, and belonging, topics I'm very interested in. Um, she's also a speaker, a consultant, a coach, and has been featured in Financial Times, Top 100 Most Influential Women in Engineering in the UK and Europe. Wow, I feel very honored to have you, Jenny. Um, Jenny is well-versed in how to create culture, manage change, leadership, strategy development, and much more. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, so without further ado, Jenny, thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy day. Thank you. It's lovely to be here and talking to you. So let's just start with you. Can you give a summary of your background and your journey to where you are now? Sure. Um, it's a bit um, windy. So I began my career originally as a corporate lawyer. I studied law at university because um, that's what clever kids from working class Scotland who don't want to study medicine do. Um, and then came to London for an adventure and joined um, one of the, the big city law firms from called Linklaters and um, did my training contract and became a corporate lawyer and loved lots and lots of aspects of that, the intellectual challenge, the adrenaline, working in a big team, making things happen, and really didn't like the fact that I never got to see the end of the story. When you do a, a, a corporate transaction and you know, two firms are merging or you're creating a joint venture to do something new, as a lawyer, you're involved in the kind of structuring and making that happen, but then you never get to see what happens next. So when I was still um, a relatively junior lawyer, I took a bit of a shot in the dark and went to work for the then managing partner of um, my law firm who needed someone to be a kind of dog's body, bag carrier, speech writer, general assistant to him. Um, and that kind of role when you're young is so exciting and so instructive because you kind of have access on areas and you can be around board tables that you wouldn't otherwise be around and listening and learning how business really works. Um, so I did that and at the same time I did an MBA so that I had kind of theory and practice happening very much um, hand in hand. And when you're young like that and have no direct authority, people tell you the truth about all sorts of stuff. So the, yeah, I learned so much about what motivates people and how to build relationships and rapport with people. So much so that off, I, I came out of my MBA, I, I think I went into my MBA expecting it to make me a thing in the way that being a lawyer is a kind of identity um, that I might emerge as a finance person or a marketing person. And I actually just emerged as somebody who loves businesses and strategy in the broadest sense and the role of business in society and how they impact the communities they serve and thinking about how you make sense of that whole ecosystem. And I also emerged knowing that I was fascinated um, by what makes people tick and how you unlock the potential in one person or two people or a whole organization of people to make those cool corporate level things happen. So I did a master's in coaching fairly shortly after I did my MBA. And really since then, my career has been at the space where people and culture type roles meet business and strategy type roles. Um, and sometimes with one title and sometimes with the other. So yeah, for um, a long time, I was in professional services firms in corporate roles, helping with the running of law firms by and large. Um, and then for a while, I was the people director of a big law firm. And then I became the strategy director there. Um, which is around the time that you were alluding to where I also wrote a book about some of what was going on. We can perhaps dig into some of that shortly. Um, and then bringing it right up to date, I spent three years as the um, chief people officer of Arup, which is a global design and engineering firm just rethinking their whole approach to people and culture. And I'm now with Advent International, which is a private equity firm, helping them think about the people and culture elements for themselves as a firm, but also across their whole portfolio of companies. I mean, you've got a very um, peppered past with lots of interesting roles. And I guess the thing I'd love to dive into is your that role that you took as you know, a young 
a young executive starting your career up the corporate ladder, you had access to so many leaders and you're saying, yeah. you know, they were honest with you, which a lot of the time it's, you don't get to hear that side. So I'd love to know some of the things that you learned about good leadership from being in that role and what you saw. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so the first thing I saw, I guess, because I was tra you know, traveling extensively with this particular individual, this chief exec managing partner, um, and it really, really has stayed with me and informed so much of what I do, is how he never, ever tired of telling the story of what he was trying to do, right? To the point where I was like, he was a smart guy and his brain went at 100 miles an hour. Um, so he must have been bored of hearing himself say the same thing over and over again, but he understood the importance of the story and how much that made a difference to taking people on the journey with him. Um, and I, he, he was the managing, but he oversaw an interesting period in a kind of law firm history where um, Link Matters at that time was really the first law firm to clearly articulate a strategy for the whole firm and therefore almost become a bit more corporate in that sense. Um, but he, in terms of his history with the firm, had joined the firm when it was very small and there were very few partners and had personally welcomed every partner into the firm. And so he kind of sat at this fulcrum where it mattered to him enormously that he wasn't just directing a corporate to do something. He was winning hearts and minds. So the effort that he put in and the storytelling in that context, that, that blew my mind. And when I see great leaders now and watch what they do, that passionate belief in what they're doing and the storytelling that goes with it is so often a really big feature. And um, so I learned that. But I also learned from the stuff that he wasn't as good at. And um, so perhaps it's a kind of, it's almost, in, is it inevitable? He was very good at telling stories and he was less good at listening. Um, so he would be in a room and his role would be to tell the story, but I could sit back and watch. So it meant that he, he, he would leave a room saying, well, that was a great meeting. And I could say, oh yeah, but nobody from, I don't know, the Paris office said anything. Like, do you want me to figure out why? And then that, you know, that's where not being a leader was actively helpful because you can go and have a different conversation with you know, people around the table who might not be as bought in um, by virtue of, of, of being in a different role. Um, so what did I learn? I learned about the, I guess, ultimately the importance of communication both ways, both telling a great story, but also really paying attention, not just listening, really absorbing and paying attention to the whole context that you're in. Yeah, sort of that active listening where you're even taking the cues from how they're what the body language is. Yeah, and what the room feels like and where the energy feels high and where it drops, all of, all of those things. Yeah, I mean, really good things to learn at a young place in your career. <sighs> yeah, absolutely. Um, can we talk about your book for a little bit? So Leading for Organizational Change, and can you give a little bit of background on that? Um, and how it came about. Yes, no, I would love to. So, you know, full disclosure first, I love writing. So writing is my thing. I would do it as often, you know, for as many hours as I, as I, as I have for as long as I can. And I think that's important because so many people do that kind of, you know, people are so sort of gobsmacked or impressed at people who write books. And that presumes that it's a hardship. And for me, it was a complete pleasure. So I just want to be kind of, I just want to own the fact that it was a fun adventure for me. I'm on the flip side where I'm always, I'm, I don't love writing and I always get really critical of my writing. So it takes so much more time. So I'm pleased to hear that you enjoy it and that it's so sort said, of yeah, a passion. It's important to know because if you think about how you put, make time for things in your day, it's so much easier to make time for something you love. So what really prompted the book was I was, um, I was the director of strategy for a law firm for CMS, and we were doing a series of mergers um, in, in overall terms, not huge, but in the, you know, the, the legal sector, the biggest merger in the, the city's history at, at that time. So we made a small acquisition of a firm in Scotland called Dundas and Wilson, and then we merged CMS with Navarro and Allswine to create a new firm. And I led that, that work. I was part of the team that did the deal, but then I was also responsible for ensuring that the firm was integrated and felt like one firm and that it worked. And when I was doing that work, 
which I absolutely loved, I couldn't find a book to read <laughs> to help me do it. And I am, you know, much as I love writing, I also love reading. I'm the kind of person who spends a hundred quid on Amazon before I take one practical step towards doing anything. And there wasn't a book, there were really dry books on M&A about, you know, balance sheets and value leakage. And then there were self-help books by Brenny Brown and others about how to manage change in your personal life. And I was just kind of triangulating wildly and trying to kind of sense make and, and have a theory. So what I ended up doing was writing the book that I wished I had been able to read. Um, and I, I do think this is important to say, I wanted to write it as, at that point, an under 40 woman with an under 40 woman's voice and frame of reference. Um, because so few books, still so few business books are written by women. Um, and so many of the ones that are, are explicitly about being a woman in business. And that wasn't what I wanted to write. I just wanted to write a book about business that instead of having folksy anecdotes about baseball, had folksy anecdotes about dragging my children to the dentist and you know sitting outside ballet classes and the stuff that was my lived experience because I really felt strongly that, and I do feel strongly that having a diversity of voices in the business literature canon is really important. Um, so there's a lot of things I want to unpack. One is around bringing three different organizations together with three different cultures in the law yeah. firm must have been a huge challenge. So how did they go about and how did you go about creating an overall culture and how, what was that process and how long did it take? Um, well, I've long since gone. And if you speak to people who are still there, which I do, you know, it, it's still ongoing. Right. So, um, and it sort of depends what you're aiming for. So in, in terms of process, there is tons of stuff that we can talk about. And I suspect we, we won't want to about just needing to have very clear work streams about what you're doing in relation to systems and processes and all sorts of stuff. But more kind of philosophically, we, we started from the premise that we were creating a new firm. And so in the fullness of time, we would create in, in any context, whether you're talking about, I don't know, a payroll system, an approach to client relationship development or anything in between, that we would create the best thing for the combined firm and that we wouldn't default to assuming that one legacy system was the best. But we also knew that pragmatically in the short term, we would possibly need to make some calls about what, what we went with. Um, so we, we were very careful right from the outset to tell even before we did the deal in the, the information memorandum and the, the, the approach to telling the story to the partners of the deal, that we told a single story that resonated for all three different organizations who were all coming from a different perspective, but that we were trying to achieve the same thing. And then that spirit of creating a new firm permeated everything we did and how we did it. So be that kind of decisions about who was leading particular teams or stuff about which systems we used or what language we used. We were, we were very, very careful and considered about that. Um, I'm jumping around a bit, but maybe in, in terms of what works, and actually the book talks about this too, um, because overall, overall, I, I think that certainly the market regarded and I regarded that merger as a real success. And there were a number of not perfect by any means, and um, but overall a success. And I think there were a number of reasons for that. The, the first is that um, the purpose was very, very clear and understood by everyone. And we can possibly dig into that. I think there are multiple layers to what I mean by purpose, but that golden thread that stitched together this great big thing that we're doing and then how people made sense of it for their part of the business, their practice area, their clients, their sector, and then them individually and how they fitted in. We were really clear on that and we paid a lot of attention to getting that right. Um, the second thing was we had a group of leaders who were up for it, really properly up for it and really wholehearted and really prepared to roll their sleeves up and get stuck in and be relentless and emotionally heart on the sleeve committed to doing it and that showed up in big ways you know great big presentations and in being willing to kind of you know crawl around under the tables in a regional office where the conference system still wasn't working and plug stuff in and make it work and that kind of 
it's hard to be cynical and angry in the face of demonstrable love and commitment from people, right? So the fact that we had leaders who were, were doing that made a huge difference. Um, and then the last thing, harking back to, to um, my, my first experience of that great leader at Linklaters was the storytelling. We found every good example of an exciting story <clears throat> that we could, and we, and we consciously built right from day one a new history for the new firm so that we were both honoring the legacy of where everybody had come from. But we were marking, oh, day three of the new firm, and this is the thing, we've won a new client, we've achieved this, so that we were building our story, and that made a huge difference too. And it meant that, you know, fun things, like a year on, um, our managing partner was went back through his emails and would say things like, a year ago today, these were the emails that we were sending and this is the progress we've made since so that it was very vivid and real for everyone. Amazing. OK, I want to jump to the pandemic because obviously the past two years have been a little bit crazy for everyone. Um, I'd love to know how life and work for you specifically and then for the businesses that you're working with um, had been interrupted. Um, Gosh, it's, it's, hard to, it's yeah. hard to remember, isn't it? Because it's, it's been, in a way, such a long time and so intense. So, so when the first lockdown happened, so March 2020, I was working for Arab. So I was the global people leader for Arab. And my brief until then um, had been quite indulgent really, in as much as I was creating a new strategy for the firm. So we were doing creative, forward-looking work, as well as keeping the wheels on day-to-day. -day. But keeping the wheels on day-to-day -day wasn't a big part of my job and wasn't hard. Um, and we we had a board meeting in Glasgow. Um, and also Board meetings in all sorts of glamorous locations, but in this occasion it was in Glasgow in the February 2020 and made... Um, a quite early and with hindsight really wise decision to to stop all travel at that point in the firm because we could see that you know we had we had a big business in china and and we could see what was happening there and the borders were closing so we we, we grounded everyone we were back in london um and then we went into lockdown and i was in london that day and i think everybody who was in london the days before lockdown remembers it because it was like a ghost town and it was so weird and it felt like this big thing was coming and then I lay in bed for several nights, staring at the ceiling, thinking, feeling as a people leader, almost personally responsible for the fate of 25,000 people in my organization. Right? Like, I don't know how to do this. And there's been so much written since, speaking of written work and books. But at the time, there wasn't. There was nothing about crisis management. There was stuff about reputational crises, like, you know, sort of deep water and BP and all sorts of things. But there was nothing about this kind of crisis. So we, we, I was really scared with hindsight. I don't think I'd have given that word at the time, but I felt that we were really in uncharted territory. Um, and being more personal for a second, because I think you asked about it personally as well. I felt like all these bits of my life that I had kept, kept beautifully kind of organized and segregated and sorted out all came crashing together. So I've got four kids, they were at home, homeschooling. I was working at home. Um, and I felt thwarted at the risk of sounding incredibly petty. I felt like I had kind of created this quite complicated life that worked and it all smacked it. And I felt busted <laughs> and exposed <laughs> and unsure how to be all of those different identities that I was quite good at being when they were separate all at once. I didn't know how to lead a global organization while also teaching maths yeah. and cooking dinner. Um, so that just to interrupt, funny. actually, just to interrupt yeah. for a second, because you bring this up, because this was a big, this was a big thing. And did you feel and see with your, with the rest of your team that women were taking on more because they were expected to help with the schooling, do the housework around more than male counterparts, for example? That's a really good question. And I think the short answer is yes. And that probably became more apparent or indeed happened more as the pandemic progressed. So in Arab, we we made all sorts of decisions about allowing people to, to flex their working hours, um, about being uh, allowing people to kind of sort of trade and have some flexibility and, and, and reduce hours, all sorts of you know, anything we could think of, we were kind of throwing at people to, to make it possible for them. Um, 
and our demographic was, was really mixed there and all sorts of people availed themselves of that. But as time went on, yes, I can't point to statistics, but my, my clear sense was that it was, it was when we were almost back to normal, but schools were still closed. That kind of period where some of that stuff became less visible and less in the consciousness of everybody else, where women were still really struggling, especially women with very young children. I do think that's true and fair. Um, so you asked you know, what we did, we did all sorts of things. Um, but what we really had to do first and foremost in that critical period was to speak to people, right? To, to and, and in a way, this sounds terrible, but we, I was still early stage in our strategy at, at Arab and we were being quite tentative. You know, um, engineers are wonderful people, but they're not all known for their EQ and their comfort in, in speaking into that kind of space. And we accelerated that kind of work with leaders massively during that period because we had to. So suddenly we were we were having, we were convening groups of leaders and just asking them to share what their experiences were and how they wanted to help their people in a way that would have been unimaginable like even a couple of months previously. And so some of that work, and I think it's, we're all still unpacking, aren't we, where we're at post pandemic and what we've learned and what we've lost. But some of that work was really profound and really important. I mean, it sounds so easy talking to people, talk to your people, bring them on. No, but it, you know, was, because it was unbelievably radical at the time. I know. And also then it shows like you're showing a bit of your own personal life and, and being a bit more vulnerable. And actually yeah. people yeah. seem to have responded to that on the whole throughout the pandemic. Um, I think that's right. And we've forgotten how, I think it, we've normalized so much that at that time felt really alien. Right. Um, so you moved roles during the pandemic as and many people started new jobs during the pandemic. I'm interested in how that was for you starting a new job, not necessarily being able to go in to meet your team, meet the office. Yeah, so I, I started this new role in um, September 2021. So there was that kind of slightly false dawn. And then we we lost, it's hard to remember. Then we locked down again. Um, it's been interesting. I think it's certainly made feeling very sure on my feet slightly slower um, because the stuff that you can just absorb super fast when you're physically around people all the time takes a bit longer virtually, I think. Um, in, in Advent, where I am now, a third of our people have joined since the pandemic began. Um, and that's really important to know and particularly for a relatively small relatively young organization so one of the things we've noticed for example is that um is how much of our culture was unspoken and just tacitly understood and easy to absorb if you're in the office with each other all day every day and therefore how at sea people trying to come into the organization and navigate it remotely are because they haven't got all of those cues and context and so it's challenged us to be more explicit and overt and articulate what matters to us and why it matters and that's no bad thing right because it makes our culture more robust and clearer and therefore scalable and and usable in a way that maybe it wasn't before so a third of the people are new and have joined over the past few months obviously through the pandemic um then creating culture while people are hybrid. Is it simply through just being very clear about this is how things are, or is there is it more to that? Were there specific actions that I guess you put in place when someone does on board to make sure that someone I, 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 success? I, I, I do think it's more than that. And so um so Advent, in common with lots of P firms, is relatively small um relatively intimate in terms of how it you know how it sort of thinks of its, its culture um, and the whole sector is relatively young which means that for us before the pandemic really the only way we knew to build culture because the only way we needed to know to build culture was by spending time together you know it, it's a busy sector the hours are long but people also enjoy socializing together so the culture is built through time spent physically together um, and so we have been really challenged and actually I think candidly felt quite ill-equipped on occasion to know how to convey that culture um, and the best proxy we have had has been proper time spent with people 
in this format, one to one, but not just by piling into a standard team meeting, but by ensuring that people are actually meeting. So we've done what lots of organizations have done and had coffee roulettes and, a way, and ways of people meeting randomly. But we've also been very clear with leaders, when, especially when they have new people in their team, that investing the time in just getting to know one another socially and slightly less formally is, is really, really important. So yes, and then in time we can build on how you onboard and how you articulate the culture, but that personal connection and as close a proxy as you can get for that is what really matters. Um, and just talking about worker well-being, some of a lot of that plays into it, like getting someone to feel connected plays into worker well-being. I'm just wondering how you look after your employees and build sort of a build a culture of well-being with a busy busy office, growing fast, lots of deals, I'm sure, taking place. Yeah, and we, we haven't always got it right um, either. It's hard um, because for, for, for many people, for, the, for a lot of people we have in the organization, the, the gap between good stress and good busy and the stuff that drives people and gives them that high octane, you know, adrenaline excitement the, the, the space between that and too much is very, very short. Um, so you that requires one to be quite wise and discerning about what kind of well-being interventions you create and how you offer them to your people. Um, so we have stuff. For example, we just had an update meeting this morning. We, we use Unmind, the app, which I really love. It's robust. It's science-backed. It gives really good insights um, in terms of the reporting. And it enables people to access really really good resources on terms that work for them so there's a piece which is just putting that in place um much more importantly i th i think um we've been paying attention just to ensuring that the culture feels like a place where people can raise you know concerns and ask for help and show vulnerability and um pe isn't known for that um but particularly having leaders who are willing to be honest and role model what they're doing and how they're managing. We have um, all open diaries here, which I hadn't encountered before and love because it means that people are putting in things like that they're going to a yoga class or they're going to the school run. The whole organization can see that. And that's just such a, sounds so small, but it changes the culture so much if we understand that our senior leaders in particular are doing that and owning that. So that all contributes to this kind of a psychologically safe space, I guess, such that people feel that they can come and raise concerns, and and you know that's the um that's the privilege of working in a small and intimate place that everybody actually has a personal relationship with someone that they can then go to, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, I love that example, and I agree. It seems so simple, but like when in the past did someone actually put um, meditation onto their schedule and yeah. allow their team to see that? But actually, just by doing that shows the value that meditation or yoga or picking up their children, whatever it is, that's a value to that person. And it is an insight on how they are as a leader and just as a human being in general. Yeah. So that's great. I love that example. So thank you for sharing that. I don't think enough companies do that. And it's something that could be so vital. And psychological safety is something that we're hearing a lot from a lot of the clients that we speak to um and leaders and you know can we get a webinar on it no you can't get a webinar on it because actually <laughs> there's like it's more than just a webinar topic yeah absolutely. um i know you um talk a lot about diverse um diverse teams and diversity and inclusion i'd love for you to give a little bit more insight onto your thoughts on dni oh um <laughs> Sort of a so broad think, question. Sorry about it's a, that. It's a, it's a very broad question, and, and maybe I'll sort of give you sort of two different buckets in in in, in the answer. Um, I suppose the first part is that um, I nearly mentioned this in the context of talking about my experience at Arab during the pandemic, because um, you will remember, everybody will remember that hot on the heels of, of of the pandemic came the murder of George Floyd, and actually for Arab at the time, given our culture and our demographic, that was as seismic, if not more seismic, in terms of the impact that that had on our organization as the pandemic. The pandemic was the pandemic. We were a global firm. We were hedged. We had ups and downs, but that was huge for us. And it was um, it was huge for me personally. It was the most 
challenging period of my career in terms of being required both personally and professionally to to reassess to unlearn to to lean into an area that I felt deeply like I was not on familiar territory with and to commit to making a difference and, and, and making it right. Um, and I wouldn't be without that period in terms of my own growth for anything. It changed, it changed everything for me in terms of how I think and my outlook in, in a way that I'm probably still processing. Um, so we were privileged to be able to do a huge amount of work in that space at Arup when I was there. Um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the need on the one hand to be really really granular and specific when you're thinking about diversity you know the conversations that you have about race in China are different to the conversations that you have in the U.S. but even in the U.S. the conversation you have about race in Houston is different to the conversation that you have in New York right so really understanding how important it is to understand your context and how to to navigate that but I also learned that I had been letting myself off the hook that way a little bit and about the importance of signaling globally as an organization that had the share of voice that we had, what our commitment and what good looks like for us as an organization, particularly when it comes to inclusion, which is much more universal. So if you talk about what are the building blocks, and we touched on some of them just now, that you need to build a truly inclusive organization, the whole firm has to own that and deliver it. Um, so tons of thoughts around that. and. Then I arrived in the PE sector where diversity is just the most enormous challenge and is systemic and difficult in a way that's very different from other sectors I've been in before and requires a different way of thinking again. And so we're still and I'm still learning and there's still a huge amount to do in this sector. Um, let's talk a little bit about leadership and purpose. Um, your your definition of good leadership is what? Oh, um, um, I had a boss who used to describe it as just clearing that the only or the main role of a leader was to clear the obstacles off the runway so that other people could fly. And I, I think that's not far off, but I... I want to make people feel brave and to be able to do things that they didn't think that they could do. That's what, I, you know, um, but it's more than that because you're also responsible for kind of, you know, making sure that more obstacles don't arrive and for the condition of the runway and for a whole heap of, of other things. But ultimately for me, it's about trusting and empowering people. Um, in terms of what it takes to do that, the, 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 the older the older I get and the harder I think, I think you have to have such a high level of self-mastery and be able to get out of your own way to lead well. I think it's very, very difficult to lead when your own ego is up and asserting itself in the room and to know yourself and to have a huge amount of self-compassion and be able to be invested in looking after yourself such that you're in the state where you can give and lead feels critical to me. Um, as does loving what you do, right? Being able to tap into the deep joy, be it you know, for, for whatever reason, people have different motivations, but there has to, I think, in order to lead well, you have to be, yeah, there has to be joy. Um, so you touched on self-compassion. We talked a little bit about vulnerability. Um, so I'd love to just talk a little bit more about vulnerability in the sense of psychological safety. Because for me, they sort of play into each other. And if we don't show our vulnerability a little bit, then it's hard to create a psychological, psychologically safe environment. Um, do you see this as one of the key traits of a leader today, today, as we speak? Yes, 100%. Um, with skill, I, I think, um, by which I mean that there, there, there is an inherent tension between one of the things that you're trying to do as a leader, which is to command confidence, right? And in a really uncertain environment where everybody else is feeling unsure, to, to give enough sense of safety by saying, I kind of, <laughs> sort of, I have a plan, let's go this way and let's try this thing and I know how to make it okay. Um, so vulnerability in the sense of unguarded, 
panic, categorically not, but being able to show your own humanity and be revealing of aspects of yourself and where you struggle and to do that in a way that is intentionally in service of the people that you're working with and the goal that you're trying to achieve. So with my own team, for example, I've got a really young team here who have less miles walked under their belt than I do on some stuff. So being able to share some of where I have struggled rather than looking like this annoying, you know, disconnected idiot who doesn't understand their environment, to be able to story tell about where I've experienced that and how I felt and what it was like for me does absolutely help to build to build as you say the safety and the trust that people need in order to to develop and to make the change because inevitably if you're letting go of one way of being and moving towards something new that's scary and so you have to know that it's safe oh, i'd love to know a little bit more about how you get the most out of your team so you have this young team um, how do you help them navigate through this new way of working that's new for all of us in fact Um, I don't always get it right. So first and foremost, I hire people that I trust, right? That there's something in me that sees a kind of wholeheartedness, a curiosity, an openness, a willingness to learn in other people. And then on that basis, I will trust them as much as I can, as fast as I can. Um, that means that if I'm going to make a mistake, the mistake I sometimes make is, is in being too hands off. I, I, the mistake I, 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 I'm, I'm not prone to micromanagement. I'm prone to, oh crap, you needed help there. <laughs> and I could have helped you more. So with my team, I, I'm a coach. So I should probably have said that at the beginning. So I spend most of my time here at Advent and I spend quite a bit of time coaching and also teaching people to coach. I'm on, on the faculty of a, of a coaching organization and those are the skills I deploy with my team ultimately right so I seek to to get that to, to draw out of them the insights and the, you know the, the the wherewithal and the resourcefulness that they already have and the ideas they already have to do the thing um and I then try carefully and masterfully to give them the additional insight and the experience that I have that they might not have yet to, to help them and augment it and I try to do that in a way that shows my working so that I, I'm quite explicit I think with my team about what I'm asking them to do and why so that it's a it's a learning moment so that they can then take that and put it in their toolkit and, and use it again rather than just directing for the sake of, of directing um I want always wanted to be beyond doubt with my team that I love them and I use that word advisedly and have their back and trust them um but somebody when I was transitioning between roles a former colleague talked to a new colleague and they said um oh with Jenny um don't mistake her kindness for weakness and I thought that was like the best thing I was so excited that somebody had said that because that's what I want I I, um, I will be kind forever but I'm not weak, and you know there are there are lines. We set the bar high. high. We we serve an organisation that requires excellence in all things. So we have to be exacting and we have to be ambitious. But we have to be ambitious, kind of together. It's not them and and, and me. We're 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 in an adventure together. So I'm um, kind, but not weak. <laughs> that is a great. I would love to be described as that. I think that's very good, powerful. Right? So very surprised. powerful. <laughs> I was just reading some a, a book about trusted teams and it was like, okay, we've all, it was sort of what you're talking about. We all have each other's back. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's just nice to each other all the time. You also can have sort of fruitful conversations and test each other. But at the end of the day, you also know that you've got someone, someone's looking out for you and you're looking out for someone else. And we had that this week, we had a bump in the team and there was some conflict and it felt gnarly and difficult, right? We all had to kind of show up and say quite uncomfortable things to each other. And then I reminded them that we had, we had this offsite where when we were all getting on and it was beautiful, we described how we wanted to be able to be a team that disagreed with each other. And that all sounds lovely in theory. And then when you're in it, it feels really messy and uncomfortable. But actually, this is what we wanted, you know, a good team where we're just superficially nice to each other all the time 
that's not actually going to make us develop and grow, but this ability to kind of get through some hard stuff together yeah. and emerge on the other side is, yeah, it feels yucky, but it's good. But it's good. It's good for the strength of the team. It is. Um, it really what is. is. What's your view on corporate well-being programs and the investment involved? So you have on mind, but I'm just thinking about other just bigger, broader programs of well-being. Um, I'm not worried about the investment involved, as and in I think for every organization, it sounds trite, but you know, no organization is all organizations are just groups of human beings, right? So in, in, unless you're kind of supporting those human beings to be able to do what they need to do, it's a completely fruitless and ultimately, you know, it's not going to work. The, the, that thing will crash eventually. Um, but it has to work. So I, I do think that, you know, it, it's a crowded sector and I, you know, I, I wouldn't advocate doing anything just for the sake of doing it. And um late in life, you know, partly by working with some engineers and now with some PE people, I'm all about data and, and evidence for things working. And so finding what works and then going large on that. And I don't think there's some stuff that it, the reason I like on mine, as I mentioned, is because it's robust and it is data and science backed. But there'll be some things that work for some organizations and, and not for others. Um, what was my other thought on that? But the, the other and maybe this is not an, an, an issue for many organizations, but it was for Arup because of the kind of organization we were there. I do think our companies have to think about where their responsibility starts and stops. Um, and, and we got into some quite difficult territory when we, when we were, and the pandemic is so unprecedented, right? So people were suffering and struggling in ways that an organization wouldn't ordinarily have had to lean into, but understanding what you can do as an organization and what you can't. You can give information, you can empower your people, you can give people permission. But and that for me, I'm not as clear as, as I would like to be still on on how far the arm of an of an organization, sorry, the wave to make my lights come back on, <laughs> um, reaches and, and, and where responsibility starts and stops. But I do think, just going back to where I started, the welcoming of your people is the the fundamental foundation on which everything is built in every organization thank you for saying that that was like the perfect the perfect answer because it's true if your people aren't well then you don't really have a business you don't have people to doing? show up yeah. to do their job yeah yeah exactly um have you found i'm just interested in when you're looking at your data are there certain parts within your um certain parts of unmind that you're seeing them use more versus others and um, we've not seen that yet because I haven't got a long enough history here to, to know. Um, but for me, the attraction of Unmind is how broad it is versus other apps that are, that are out there and how, you know, I, it, it, it covers chronic pain, it covers menopause, it covers a, a, a broad range so that people can tap in. But no, I've not seen any particular trends just yet. That I could and, and that points to a really good point. Like, well-being is not just one thing it's so many different things um and everyone approaches it in a different way everyone needs something different and that's that's where you as a person me as an employee needs to be able to address my specific needs rather than what the organization is telling me i should exactly. be need. yeah exactly yeah. yeah um and what about your personal well-being what are your yeah. practices what are the things that make you complete and being able to show up fully and wholly at work and in life? That's a good question. Um, I work hard for my mental health, right? And I, I think it's important to, to say that. Um, so I, I am prone to being an anxious overachiever, perfectionist, you know, lacking in confidence, any number of things. And so, and I know that I'm at my, best when I look after myself. Um, I remember years ago going to kind of one of these big name therapists in the city that all the broken city people go to. I, I, I won't name him um, as if he had a kind of magic wand in his office. Um, and he said, well, I'm, I won't even really speak to you until you've got the basics right and you are eating properly and sleeping and exercising because everything else on that on top of that is just window dressing and I think about that a lot and tell other people in my, in my team that a lot so I do um what do I do I meditate 
every morning some days pretty poorly because I cannot concentrate but I really try um, and, and 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 commit to that as a discipline I've been doing that for nearly two years and it's game changing long way when you reflect that over the course of two years how different does that feel that's huge for me um I exercise probably not enough but I go to the gym I lift heavy things I you know get hot and sweaty and that makes me feel so much better um I write when I can not enough because I love it and that fills the well and makes me feel complete and rich um and then I try my best as um their needs change and their desire to spend time with me changes to spend good time with my kids because again all of these things sound trite because they're true you only get them once right? and they they change fast and that's the other it's difficult to talk about upsides of the pandemic but I had time with them that I would never have had and that kind of made me retrospectively realize how much I wanted time with them so I now more consciously plan that into my into my week so um no I don't work like the me of 15 years ago by any stretch of the imagination it's much more balanced and I think believe that I add more value as a result actually thank you for all of that and I feel like that's a whole nother conversation that we could get into is around sort of that transition from you know when you're early on in your career thinking you need to do everything all the time and you're just busy 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 to then you know there's other things happening in your life and you realize actually you're, you can do better by actually not just wearing that badge of busyness, like a, you know, wearing business, like a badge of honor. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, yeah. But thank you for sharing all of your practices because look, like you're a senior executive have such a big role and actually you take time for yourself to be able to show up as your best self in at work and with your family and with others. And you've touched on all the things that we talk about at Conscious Working on as it's holistic. It really is, well-being isn't just one thing. You need to look after all different parts of it. And one of which is really important is the connection, connection with family, people in your, you know, colleagues, whoever. So thank you for sharing all that, Jenny. Thank you. Um, this has been such a lovely conversation. I really appreciate you taking your time out. We obviously had a little bit of a delay with technology, but we managed to figure I'm it so out. I'm so sorry about that, but um, yeah, not you. at all. Um, if people wanted to find you, find out more about you, learn more about your book, how can they find you? Ah, they can find me on LinkedIn. They can also find me on jenemery.com. So jenemery, right. all one word, dot com, where I blog sporadically <laughs> not often enough but um links to the book um both the book we talked about and I'll, i also have a random side hustle in poetry and that is all there wonderful well we'll put that all into the notes so people can access it directly yeah. um i really appreciate your time your openness your honesty um even a bit of vulnerability thank you very it's been much such a treat thank you so much for asking me what, I'm, what a privilege to talk about myself for a bit <laughs> kind but definitely not weak thank you very much jenny oh, emery thank you so much <laughs> take care bye-bye until next time everyone be here and be well Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you in the next episode. And by the way, if you like what you heard, then hit subscribe to receive all the future episodes. Better yet, if you're feeling inspired by what you just heard, then leave a review letting me know who else you might wanna hear from on Conscious Leaders. To learn more about the show, about Conscious Working, or Tribe, our membership, head over to our website, consciousworking.co. Yes, it's just CO. So consciousworking.co. And for those of you that might be suffering burnout, we have a great free resource, the Beat Burnout Guide. It's a really simple assessment with tools for you to take action now. Check it out in the show notes so that you can access it immediately. See you in the next episode. Be here and be well.